Acts chapter 17, verse 31, while standing in the Areopagus, the Apostle Paul announced from God. He said that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now nearly 2,000 years have passed and that appointed day is nearer than ever. There are many in our world who don't know about that coming day of judgment and many who do know about it simply dismiss it. That's just a weird idea, a bit of a weird notion that those religious people have. Some will go a wee bit further and they scoff at the idea of it and they like to have a go at Christians for believing in such a thought for the end of the world. But it was like that in the first century as well. Uh, Peter writes in his second letter in chapter 3 and he says that in their day, scoffers would come. Men would say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But he goes on to reassure them of the truth that is promised in verse 9. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We saw that revealed will of God earlier today as we considered thy will be done from the Lord's prayer. It is God's revealed will that all should come to repentance. It's vital that each and every one of us repent of our sins and get right with God. The world out there, they may scoff at the notion, but in the light of Scripture, there is nothing more important for every one of us here tonight We must turn from sin. We must cry to God for forgiveness and pardon. And we must do so while there is time. None of us know when the judgment of God will fall. But it is a certainty. It will come. We will all stand before the judge and be tried according to the righteousness of the one true holy God of heaven. Judgment is coming, and we do not know when. Now, the nation of Judah, back in the days of Manasseh, the king before Ammon, who we read of here this evening, uh, back then a message of judgment had also been delivered. The Lord announced through his prophets the words of 2 Kings chapter 21, 12 and 13. Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle and I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab and I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Well, what would they do with that message of judgment? And we pick up the story in 2 Kings 21 where Judah got their new king after Manasseh, who was such a wicked king, had died. And this was Manasseh's son. His name was Ammon. Uh, we read of him in verse 20. Uh, verse, yes, verse 20. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. Some detail is given in the next two verses. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked. He served the idols that his father had served and worshipped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. And in the next verse we are told that his own servants assassinated him in his own house. We're not told why. But it was a really dangerous thing for Judah for that to happen. Because as bad as Ammon was, he was still born in the line of David. And that kingly line was one of heredity. 
And that left Judah without a, without a Davidic king, without a king in the line of David, their greatest king. And for all of their, you know, their weakness and their failing and, and their own wickedness, uh, the people of Judah knew their only hope of security in the face of judgment was if that Davidic line, that ancestral line of David, would continue. They knew the promise that God had made to David back in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. And so we have it there in verse 24. The people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. Faced with coming judgment, they took steps to ensure their survival. And I want us to trace five steps in this chapter that teach us how we too can escape that coming judgment of God. Now, not everyone in Judah took all five steps, but King Josiah did. Let's learn from him first one is this get yourself under authentic ministry the step we've seen already the people of the land they got rid of the servants of Ammon they were the ones who had left Judah in that dangerous position without a king in the line of David dangers vacuumed a hand and rather than it being filled with any Tom Dick or Harry they made sure they got one of David's descendants to reign over them Ammon's son Josiah he was only eight years old when he became king. So I don't imagine, you know, that they really knew at that point that he was going to turn out to be such a good and a godly king. But they did know his pedigree. He was of the line of David. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. Those names, they don't mean a whole lot to us tonight. To be honest, when you look through the commentaries, they don't mean a lot to anybody else either. But their record here in Scripture means that they did mean something at the time to the people of Judah. His background was known. And they wanted this. They wanted a steady Davidic king to rule him. A legitimate king. A king who was the real thing. Not some imposter, not some outsider, but a genuine, authentic, God-approved king. Again, I can only imagine that another Manasseh may have fitted the bill for most of them just as well. But I see in the grace of God, they got a godly Josiah. But the point is this, their first step, it was a good one, it was in the right direction. They wanted a proper Davidic king. Authentic ministry. You've come to knock EP tonight. And by the grace of God, you find yourself in such a ministry. Now, your minister may not be on a par with King David or King Josiah, but by the grace of God, I am saved. I'm trusted in the Lord Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I am a sinner saved by him. And the same is true for every other office bearer in this congregation. And yes, we are not all that we should be in lots of ways, but we belong to Christ. We're not the perfect thing, but we are, by God's grace, the real thing. And what is true for the office bearers in the church is also true of the membership of the church. Every member has made a credible profession of faith in Christ as God the Son, our Savior and Lord. We have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, we're not perfect, not at all. But by the grace of God, we're the real thing. And to step into such a place tonight, it's a very good first step to take when you consider the coming judgment. But it is just that, a first step. There are more to follow. 
The next step is taken by Josiah when he's 26 years old. He takes an interest in the things of God. This is what the young king focuses on in his early reign. It's a good step. Uh, but as we read, the things he focuses on, they're all sort of external things. He's concerned about the finances in verse 4. He wants it to be counted by Hilkiah, the high priest. And he's concerned about the finances because he's concerned about the physical condition of the temple. It's in a state of disrepair. It's damaged. It needs work. It needs workers. Carpenters, builders, masons there in verse 6. They need to buy timber and stone and repair the house. And Josiah wants the work done ASAP. And he leaves it in the hands of faithful men. No need to be counting out every bean there in verse 7. These men, they're faithful men. He's got the right men doing it. And Josiah is maybe focused on the externals at this point rather than the inner workings and the ministry of the temple. Yes, it looks like he's more interested in the structures rather than the sacrifices. But when you consider Ammon before him and Manasseh before that, this is another step in the right direction. He's taking an interest in the things of God. He's thinking about God's house. He's thinking about God's honor. He wants to remove the dishonor of disrepair. He wants to restore something of the intended glory of the temple. It is, after all, God's house. And Josiah, he wants to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. He wants to walk in all the ways of his father David. David who wanted to build that magnificent house. But God had said, no, I could be your son. And it was. It was Solomon who built it. So it is a good step. Because Josiah is beginning to think about God's honor and God's name. God's name has been put upon his house. Therefore, God's house should be repaired and restored at this point in their history it has been stripped of the gold and silver several times high time that was put right good on you Josiah it's a good step what about you then tonight are you taking an interest in the things of God are you thinking about God's name you think about the things of God, say, on a Tuesday morning or a Thursday evening. Not just when you're at church. Of course we're all thinking about the Lord right now. See, here's Josiah. He's king. No doubt he has a thousand other things to attend to, including the threat of Assyria, which is very real and pressing, and the rising threat of Babylon as well. Well, but even as he looked out on that turbulent political world, He's still interested in the things of God. Such things were not, you know, a, a private matter or a small matter. When we read them here in the text, we can tell it was a priority for him. Is it your priority? The things of God. Are you interested? Do these things matter to you? Does the honor of God's name matter to you? I mean to be here in church it's good but to actually engage and switch on and to have an interest in the word well that's another step and it is a step in the right direction but the next steps are critical first is this listen listen to God's word in those temple repairs Hilkiah the high priest he finds a book it's not just a book, it's the book of the law. Faithful commentators agree it's likely to be a scroll containing some of the biblical book of Deuteronomy. Parallel account in 2 Chronicles 34 verse 14 calls it the book of the law of Moses. And I think we as New Testament readers know the importance of the scriptures. But such importance seems to sort of have been lost in those days of spiritual decline in Judah. The end of verse 8 is sort of telling. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Well, why did 
Hilkiah the high priest not read it? You know, it's, it's only been discovered. Was he ministering without the word of God? Was he just relying on God's word passed down orally? Unaware of the existence of this book? Well, we're not told. But it's a little surprising that he just sort of hands the book over to Shaphan the scribe. And then he reads it. And even then, when he reads it, it really doesn't have the mind-blowing effect that it has on Josiah. Because although he knows there's something significant about this book, when he comes and reports, he talks about the building work and the restoration work first, and only second does he talk about the book. Verses 9 and 10. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Okay, so he talks about money and building stuff first. But I think he does seem to have you know, an inclination to the significance about this book that they have found in the temple. And so he reads it aloud before the king, this book of the law of Moses. Uh, but it is really a part of uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, and again, uh, experts have kind of looked into it. And their best suggestion is Deuteronomy chapters 28 to 31, uh, what is in the scroll. And in the middle of that, we have these verses. This is from Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 19. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away, so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. It fits, doesn't it? As Josiah hears these words in the light of their recent history, which has been such a departure from everything good that God commanded, he now responds in verse 11. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. He heard the words. He listened to the words. Those words, they sunk down deep into his mind and into his heart. And he knew then, as never before, that the prophesied judgment was well deserved. The judgment must surely come because the Lord has not just announced it in recent history, but the Lord has given reasons why it would come even before that. Judah's heart has well turned away from the Lord their God. They're only getting what was promised beforehand. And Josiah, he listens intently and he recognizes immediately the importance and the relevance of God's word. And do you? Recognize the importance and the relevance of your Bible? Recognize the importance of God's law the demand that it puts upon you? Do you recognize that you have fallen short of the glory of God? Do you see that God's judgment is exactly what your sin and my sin deserves? The moment the law was read to Josiah, the penny dropped immediately. He knew. He knew he was done for. 
like Isaiah when he saw the Lord, Isaiah 6 verse 5, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now Josiah didn't see the Lord but he heard the Lord and he knew he was finished. The promised judgment, it was just, it was right. And facing that awful judgment made him take another step. Number four, seek the Lord while he may be found. Josiah did this, he sought the Lord in verse 12 he commands five faithful men to seek the Lord on his behalf and off they go these five men there verse 13 go inquire of the Lord for me for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found for and he gets it for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book they go. These five men, they make their way to a prophetess, Hulda, in verse 14. They speak with her. Josiah, through this detachment of faithful men, he really does seek the Lord. He has heard the word of judgment that was pronounced to his grandfather Manasseh, and he has heard the veracity, the truthfulness of those words in the word written down in the book of the law. He's undone. He and the nation is weighed in the balance of God's holy justice and found wanting. The judgment announced is not only promised. They know they deserve it. Every part of it. His only course of action is to cast himself upon the mercy of God. Tears his clothes as he hears the word. Yes. He's arrested. He's convicted of his own sin and the sins of his nation. But then he takes this other step and he goes to God for mercy. Have you done that? Have you taken that step of repentance? You know, you've heard the verdict of God upon your own sin and you've felt it crushing you. You know, if I were to die tonight, I would be lost forever. And so you've fled, fled to the Lord Jesus and asked for forgiveness. Have you done that? Are you concerned about the coming judgment? Because it is coming. God has revealed it in his word. Hebrews 9, 27. And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. We face this. This is not just ancient history. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. From the lips of Jesus himself in Matthew 25, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Yet he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. And that judgment day is set. Christ will return. He will judge the world in righteousness and there is no escape. But that day is not yet. Like Josiah, we live in the time between the announcement of the judgment and the actual day of judgment. We live in between the first and second comings of the Lord Jesus. We live in a time when there is opportunity to seek the Lord and be saved. 
why God sent Jesus into the world the first time. John 3.16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, Josiah didn't have that verse. He didn't have such a clear promise of salvation. What a blessing that we do have it. He didn't have that. He didn't have the words of Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. It's so clear for us today. But it's clear from what Josiah did that he did know enough. He knew what God was like. I already read 2 Kings 22 verse 2. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. He knew what God was like. God had revealed himself in the history of Israel and Judah. Read this in Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Is that visitation of judgment was coming, but knowing that the Lord was merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Josiah just cast himself upon the Lord. He sought the Lord. The Lord heard him. And the Lord answered him. And when God spoke, Josiah believed him. And that's really the final step that he took and it is the step that each one of us must take if we are to be ready for that final judgment. Number five, believe what God says. Put your faith in him. God's words to Josiah, they're recorded there, verses 15 to 20. Verses 15 to 17, God made plain that his judgment must surely come. God's wrath could not be quenched verses 18 to 20 Josiah was told of God's mercy because his heart was tender because he humbled himself before God when he heard about the judgment of God because he tore his clothes and wept before God he would be spared he would be saved he would die and go to heaven God willing, in a fortnight's time, in the next chapter, we'll see what believing God's words looked like in his life and in his reign. But tonight we leave Josiah there. He has taken these five steps when facing the judgment of God. First of all, the, the nation under an authentic king. As we applied it to ourselves, we said, yes, he got himself under authentic ministry. It's what we must do. First step. Then he took an interest in the things of God. Then he listened to the word of God. Then he sought the Lord while he may be found. And he believed what God said. And he put his trust in the good, in the gracious, in the merciful God. And so my question tonight is this. How many, how many of these steps have you taken? By virtue of you being here tonight, I think you've taken the first two at least. I hope you've listened tonight too, not just to me, uh, but to the Lord as he speaks through his word. But it still leaves two more steps. You must seek the Lord while there still is time. And you must take that final step of putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Peter preached in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 19-21. He quoted from the prophet Joel. God said, what was coming? I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. 
sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that great and awesome day of the Lord, it's closer now. And God has given us even more assurance that it is certainly coming. Remember, we started with those words from Acts 17, 31. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. God has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. That's our Jesus. That's our Savior. He is risen from the dead. He was crucified for our sins. He took the judgment of God for all who would believe in him raised for our justification raised to make us right with God and because he lives all who believe in him will also live and we will live forever with him in glory so please make sure you're trusting in him for salvation the judgment it is unquenchable it is unstoppable it is certainly coming but in Christ we are safe he who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe the son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him Amen let's pray together please well father we thank you for your word Lord that you've brought us in tonight given us an interest in the word of God you've helped us to listen but Lord I pray please make our hearts tender to your word help us Lord please to humble ourselves before you Lord may it be our portion tonight that we are given true and earnest repentance that each one of us could say yes I'm ready for that awesome day because I'm trusting in Jesus and already he has taken my judgment for me. Make our hearts tender, please. Keep us believing in the Lord Jesus.